No role plays, no conference calls, no BS. Chris and Lorenzo share four decades of combined experience to help you become a more effective leader. This is Hacking Your Leadership. Welcome to Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Chris. And I'm Lorenzo. And welcome to our final holiday hack. This is a new year. It is 2024. And starting next week, we're going to go back to our regular episodes of Hacking Your Leadership. Um, this is the final holiday hack where we're talking about the most watched videos by uh, current and up and coming leaders in Generation Z. We've gone through a lot of these videos. They've all been great. And on our final video, we're going to be talking about The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. And I, it's a book that I read when it came out um, s several years ago now. Uh, and it's clear why this video is being watched by a lot of up and coming leaders and current leaders because the content is very relevant. It was relevant, maybe even a little ahead of its time when it, w when it first came out. Um, and I think it is, you know, perfectly relevant right now. I think it's a good way to end the series. Yeah, I uh, I remember watching this exact video back when it came out, like in 2018, and um, or or even before that. I don't remember exactly when it was, but I was like, this is something like like this idea, this concept, this uh, the way that. I view leadership and we talk about like the journey and we talk about um, how, you know, I, I say like, don't, don't, don't confuse milestones with mile markers and understand it. Like, you know, the title is just the next job for the next job for the next job, but like leadership is truly a journey. So don't get, don't, don't think that just because you finally got that one position, you finally made it and you can stop learning and growing and leading. Um, and so I, I just love this kind of concept of understanding that uh, it, it's constantly happening. And while you're going to have parts of your career in leadership where you do need to uh, take on a role and be in that role for a while and really kind of absorb all the lessons and learnings that you can get from it as many as possible, like your 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 life and your leadership journey is continuous and um and and I really like this book and this concept because I think it it speaks to that in a lot of different stories and examples that I think a lot of leaders can relate to. Um, so I've been a fan of this for a while. It's one of the books that is on my bookshelf right now. I've got a couple copies of it. Um, it's one of the books that I will recommend to a lot of leaders when they're maybe feeling like stuck or when they kind of see like that next thing they're trying to accomplish is like the thing and like they just want to get there and I'm like and I and I want you to get there too but I want you to take that into context of what we're really doing here and kind of zoom out um, so I'm a huge fan of this right for sure um, he, he says that in an infinite game you have to have five things and the very first thing that he says is that you have to have a just cause and when he says this the first thing I think of is is the video that kind of made Simon Sinek famous, which is his golden circle, the, you know, you have to start with your why in the middle and then work out from there. And it's a it's a great video. It's it's probably 20 years old now, and it's what kind of put his name on the map first. Um, so you have to have a just cause, and you have to have people who are willing to sacrifice for the advancement of this cause. Um, you, you can't be against something. You have to be for something. And... I, I, I like this as a starting out point because if you don't have that to begin with, it's really difficult to get the other things. It's really difficult to to find the other four things that he talks about as necessary for an infinite game if you don't start with this. So they, they do build on each other. Um, the, we, I see people all the time who will leave a job not because something else came up that they want to do, but because they don't like what they're currently doing. And they end up job hopping or going from place to place to place because they can't find their thing and they think that they'll just kind of happen upon it. This isn't how life works. You, you have to figure out what you stand for and then you have to be willing to sacrifice things in order to advance whatever that cause is. Um, we've seen you know, in the news recently the, um, the, the former CEO and the founder of Panera saying – you know, clearly uh, workers nowadays aren't excited by the idea of of adding shareholder value. It's like, yeah, of course, of course they're not. That's not something that you can get behind as a just cause that you're willing to sacrifice for unless you have a significant number of shares, I guess, in whatever that organization is. Um, so I, I love that he starts there. And I really like that the second thing that you need on top of that, uh, on top of a just cause is you have to have courageous leadership. And, and this is what we're all about in Hacking Your Leadership is 
is is the courage of leadership to do what's right, to lead with values in the moment, and to make decisions in spirit of that broader and and just cause that you have figured out as a team together and you have leaders that will stand behind it and will fight for it and will fight for their people. Yeah, and and I think purpose, like I think that's the other part of it as well is like really and truly understanding uh, the, the purpose, like, like your purpose, what, dr- not just what drives you, um, like not just why you do the things that you do. Um, it, but, but really and truly understanding what brings you joy. I, I think that, you know, there's a, um, uh, there, there's a, there's a proverb that I heard the other day on a video that I was watching and it says like, with all labor, there's profit. And kind of the idea is like, when you put yourself to work into something in in your, you're you're committed to doing something, even if the outcome is not what you want. There's something to learn there. There's some pride that you can have there. There's a lesson to learn there. But that when you really apply yourself to something, there's a lot that you can get from it if you see the world that way. And I think the same thing here and in leadership is that if you enjoy, if you find joy and watching people grow and develop, if you find joy in watching them succeed and move forward, if you find joy in people exceeding their own expectations and doing things they never thought they could do, then this is the job for you. And regardless of where you're at, what you're doing, whether you're having a good week, a good month, a good quarter or not, those things will apply some pressure to a job that you get paid to do, but you will find joy in the journey and in the work. Or you will figure out what brings you joy, meaning you may not find joy in that thing, and right. it becomes a, a, a your ability to, to, to realize that and to, and to help you kind of steer the course of your own life to find something that you do find joy in because it is when we whatever we do for work it it is it's impossible to do it well for years and years and years if we don't actually like doing it if we aren't if it doesn't bring us joy and so being able to figure this out and knowing that if you haven't figured it out at 18 or 20 or 22 or 28 or 38 it's not about having it all figured out. It's about understanding when you haven't figured it out and knowing that it might change over time. You, what you what you desire and your priorities in life will change over time. And so you'll constantly having to steer and re-steer and change direction in order to make sure that you are finding joy in the work that you're doing because you're doing yourself and your people a disservice if you are doing day by day something that you don't find joy in. Um, and and it it's... It's not the right thing to do as a leader if you're in a leadership role to to continue to half-ass it because you don't enjoy it. Because I, I, I've seen plenty of these leaders who are very nice people, but they shouldn't be in the role. And and they're not doing anything wrong, so they're not going away, but they are, they're causing a stagnation in the people that are below them because they're not developing them. They're not bringing them along for the ride. And it's because they've checked out mentally. They don't want to do this anymore but they don't have the courage to leave or to find something that does challenge them or that does bring them joy or that that would require them to make changes in their life. They're just too comfortable. All of these things, even though you might, it might seem like you're comfortable now, there's no way you can continue to find happiness in this unless you can find that joy of being challenged and to bring people along for the ride. Um, I want to continue talking about the the final three things that he says as far as things that are needed for an infinite game. But first I want to give it towards one of our sponsors. All right, the next thing that Simon Sinek says that you need for an infinite game is you have to have trusting teams. I I love that this comes after courageous leadership because you will have a trusting team if you have leadership that is trustworthy and courageous and who is doing things in spirit of that just cause. You're doing those things, you will end up with trusting teams. Um, but it takes work. It's not something that you just you just get. You have to earn it. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. You know, I had an opportunity to do a, a podcast not too long ago, and I think it even recently published. Um, but I talked about trust and kind of the idea that we t- we tend to think that like the trust is earned. And I think, in from a leadership standpoint, I talked about like trust being given, and like you you have to give trust as a leader. And what I mean by that is that you have to um, you have to allow people to feel. Uh, a, a part of the work you have to you have to give them the space to try things and to you know to to give insights and feedback and thoughts and ideas and all those types of things and then you have to go and and implement those things um you're always going to work in a space of 
you know, kind of consulting and sometimes directing when you have to direct things. But if you're going to give trust, that means you're really going to take the time to allow your people to to step up and talk and speak and uh, and and ha- and bring them along on whatever it is the the work that you have, the project that you have. And I think that's really really important. Yeah, that's so true. The next thing he says you have to have is a worthy rival. Um, he says competition reveals weaknesses. So a worthy rival isn't someone who you are constantly striving to beat. It's a worthy rival of someone that you know you will never beat and they will never beat you. But what they do do is enough things well to where you see where you need work. And and I I, I love this. I, I look at this. One of the examples I give this is the, the DMV in California has signs in it that says that reminds people that it's a felony to threaten somebody who works at the DMV. And every time I see that sign, I think to myself, what kind of experience are you giving people if you have to remind them that it's a felony to threaten a DMV employee? (laughs) If there was some semblance of competition, if there was a place you could go to other than the DMV where, where the, the revenue they take in or the, the jobs they were able to offer, the promotions they got were dependent on how many people chose to go there then they would have a different experience there and you wouldn't need to remind people that it's illegal to threaten uh, to threaten the employees. This is, the ex- this is exactly this. A worthy rival is someone who you can look at their performance, you can look at the things they do well and, and think to yourself, okay, this is where I can get better. And what it means also is they're doing the exact same thing to you. They're looking at the things that you're doing well and they're using it to, to get better themselves. And who wins is everybody because both of you are getting better and whoever you're serving is getting a better experience over time because you're both getting better off of each other. I, I think that's a, a fantastic um, thing to have. And and, it, and it, it belies the infinite game. Like that's what it means to have an infinite game is it will continue on. You don't beat them eventually and then you, you've conquered them and yes, now you're on top. You don't wanna be on top because then you will stagnate. You can't possibly strive to get better if you don't have a reason to try to get better, and that worthy rival is that reason to get better. Um, the last thing he talks about is having a flexible playbook, and this this is the thing I think leaders have a lot of trouble with, is being able to change and bend and flex the rules in the moment, because rules are rules and they need to be followed. Yeah, I think two things, you know, I, I, I'll give you a little bit of a secret, is that I view my peers as worthy rivals. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, because uh, you know, I, I look at opportunities when we're in meetings, on calls, when I'm listening, when I'm trying to see, like, we're all doing the same work, but like, how are they doing it? What sure. are they seeing, right? How are they getting maybe a different result in something? And I'm taking notes and I'm really like trying to get dialed in on like, like what are the things that they're doing that I can then implement and take with me into my leadership? Uh, because I, I'm with you on that. It's like it's not about ever beating them. Yes, I'm competitive. Yes, it's fun to talk a little bit of trash. But at the end of the day, I'm looking to learn and better myself and better my leadership. And there are lessons that I can learn and take. I am all for it. So like you have to have someone, to your point, that's also in this game that has just as much passion and drive as you do, uh, but maybe doing things a little bit differently. And then I think a flexible playbook is absolutely critical um, when it comes to strategies. I think that there are some some really strong pillars of leadership in the way that you treat people and lead people and engage people. But when it comes to how you do the work, like if you've done that element of really built trust, and then again, if you kind of like follow this through and then you go through and, and, and watch what other people are doing and take notes from that, that means you're going to have to have a flexible playbook. You're going to have to look at things and strategies differently and be able to move fluidly uh, to, to get the work done because things are always changing. Things are constantly um, in a space where, where new, you know, new lessons are learned, uh, you know, new, new members to a team. Um, new outside forces maybe impacting your business, and you really have to be able to make adjustments quickly, uh, and and have a, a a kind of a rear a real kind of fierce amount of change agility to to be successful. Uh, you know today as a leader, right, right. The he closes the video out by saying your only competition is yourself, improving yourself, being better today than yesterday, and I this really resonates with me a lot because if I don't remind myself of this, I can have a tendency to judge myself compared to other people around me as opposed to 
just what my performance or my abilities were the day before. Uh, I'll give a perfect analogy of this. Um, I have a son who's a, a very competitive swimmer. And the way that, that races work is if there's 30 people, there's only eight lanes in a pool. And so they take the, the fastest eight people and they go first, the, the next eight fastest people, and, and they go second. And I remember being in situations where he'd be in like the third heat of five heats and he would win his heat. And he'd be so excited and so impressed that he won. And I'd say, you know what this means? It means the next time you race, you're you're gonna lose. He said, why, why would you think that? I said, well, you went from being, you were the fastest person in this heat, but you weren't the fastest person overall. You were the fastest person in the third race of five races, which means now you've advanced. Now you're gonna be in one of the slower positions of the next heat up, but that doesn't mean you're slower. It means that you beat your best time and now you're racing as people who are better than you versus people who are slower than you. And and if you are constantly judging yourself by who you're next to, it will be a recipe for, for disaster because either one, you're beating them all the time, which means there's no reason to get better, or you're losing all the time, which means you can get discouraged. And it's neither. It's look at how you did the previous day, Look at what you're doing today. If you're better than yourself, the other people around you are just guideposts. Your, your competition is yourself. Make sure that you're further along than you were the day before. And if you can hang your hat on that, if you can anchor yourself to that, then, then everything else will fall into place. You're not going to be discouraged for losing or you're not going to be complacent for winning. Absolutely. And with that, it brings us to the end of this episode. This is Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Lorenzo. And I'm Chris. And we'll talk to you all next time.